Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. So, uh, my name's Crispin Freeman, but you probably knew that. Um, I'm a voice actor, and ostensibly this panel is a Q&A with me. And they've even set up a nice little microphone in the center of the aisle here. So I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might pose. If you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to stand up and get in line at the microphone. Um, you know, no running, rushing, walk to the microphone. Um, just so you know, in terms of the, uh, if I have an agenda when it comes to Q&A panels, uh, there are two topics that I like talking about the most. One is how does one work in the industry? What does it take to work in the entertainment industry as a voice actor or as a director or a screenwriter, producer in any capacity, you know, not just voice acting, but what does it take to actually work in the entertainment industry? Because it's my hallucination that some of you might be interested in working uh, on, on, in the, this profession uh, in one manner or another. Um, and the other topic that I love uh, to talk about most is uh, why we love the story so much. Some of you may be familiar with my mythology scholarship. I give presentations on mythological storytelling and hero journeys in animation, both American and Japanese, and sci-fi and fantasy films. Um, so that's basically why you dress up as the character, right? What, what is it about these stories that you are so fascinated by that it inspires you to dress up as the character and go to conventions and do all that sort of thing. So those are the two topics I like to talk about the most, but I'm open to whatever questions any of you might have. Thank you and good night. <laughs> sure. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so after you explained all that, my question feels very stupid, but um, That's all right. Winston is one of my favorite characters of yours, and one of my uh, favorite voice lines of his is when he will walk into a room and like smell and go, smells like Genji's been here. Like, what does that mean? And like, <laughs> did you like come up with that? Like, I love that line, and I just want to know like what that means. <laughs> like, I did not come up with that line. No. <laughs> They, um, the, the, the only lines I've ever come up with is, um, and I'm not sure we've ever put them in the game, but uh, a couple of years ago at BlizzCon, they had uh, a United Nations of Overwatch panel. <laughs> and the video's up on YouTube, so you can check it out. But they had all of us um, say a couple of lines of our characters. And then, are there any lines you would love to hear your character say? And so I rattled off uh, Winston rapping as, you know, I love it when you call me Big Papa. Throw your hands in the air if you're a true player. You know, and uh, I thought that was funny. That was but, funny. Um, but I did not make the whole smell like, you know, smells like Team Genji. Yeah, I did that... not, no. That yeah. was not my line. Um, and honestly, I don't know enough about the lore why Winston would say that. Exactly. So sometimes when they give me lines, um, I mean, you have to understand that a lot of times when they give us just those one-offs, they're completely out of context. And like, sometimes I'll be reading them and I'll look at them and I go, is this a Carl Sagan reference? And they're like, yeah, how'd you pick that up? Or like, it'll be some reference to some other obscure movie or something. And I'd be like, oh, I gotcha. And other times I like, I have no idea what I'm saying. Gotcha. So that's one of those where I don't know why it smells like Tin Genji, but yeah. I guess it does. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, Crispin. Hello. Uh, I think this is about my second or third time seeing you at a con. Okay. Uh, last time I didn't have the, the DNA shirt and that, that kind of business thing. Uh, but uh, my question for you is actually, you were talking about the getting into the industry, getting into voice acting. Uh, my question is not directly related to getting into voice acting necessarily, but more of like working more with voice actors or being able to network uh, with voice actors, stuff like that. Uh, I know that it's weird to try to network in California and try to just kind of network. The networking is different uh, rather than like the normal way you'd go about it. Um, so well, I'm, I'm not, what are you trying to accomplish? And you can move the microphone up so you okay, don't have gotcha. to like yeah. quasi moto it. Well, yeah. like, there we go. Kind of, yeah. Technology. <laughs> um, no, it's mobile. It moves, I swear. Yeah. Um, so uh, you would network with these voice actors for what purpose? So we're a blog page, so we kind of do interviews and talk to voice actors, and we're also big fans as well of anime in general and uh, and kind of just kind of everything, manga and all that stuff. Um, so you're trying to reach out to voice actors because you would like to interview them for and your also, publication? Yeah, and also kind of do like reviews and kind of talk to them and kind of see 
what else is going on, and then also because some like yourself are really interesting. So uh, oh, voice actors like you and uh, anyone in the industry is fascinating. So it's interesting to hear um, kind of what they've done and kind of what they've gone through, like their story. So it still sounds like interviews, yeah, uh, because reviewing something usually doesn't necessarily involve talking to the artists, right? You can review a show Correct. or a manga and not necessarily talk to the artists, and sometimes they don't want to talk to you, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're being critical. Um, so, uh, you know, which is your prerogative, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a review should be honest. Um, so if you're asking, how does one connect with voice actors so that you can interview them for your publication? Yeah. Just like a better way to go about it, because, you know, you can use social media and it's only just so far, and it's like, you know, I know you kind of well. Be. I mean, it depends. Some some actors are uh, interested in engaging with the media. Mm -hmm. Some are not. Um, the best way to get uh, someone who is a performer to engage with the media is to be a really good media outlet. Cool. Right. I mean, if the New York Times calls me, I'm going to respond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, because yeah. that's a, they're a very reputable media outlet, and, uh, and so it, it, it's, it's in my self-interest to do that. Now, you're not the New York Times, and that's fine, you don't have to be. Mm -hmm. But what happens when people contact me, and I'm not, I don't know how, every actor handles this differently. Some actors don't want to be bothered. Some mm -hmm. actors are happy to talk to anybody on the street. You know, like, the actors are at different levels of, of sociability. Uh, for me, however, if someone wants my time and I'm not getting paid, mm -hmm. then I have to believe in what they're doing, right? So if someone says, we want to interview you for our website, podcast, you name it. Yeah. I say, great, can I see some of it? Can I listen to some of it? And when I watch and listen to it, if I respect their work and I say, okay, I respect your work. I'm not gonna get paid to spend my time with you, but I like what you're doing and I want to contribute to what you're doing. All right, I'm in. But if, I, if they say, well, we don't have a website up yet, then I go, then call me when you do, you know? Gotcha. Or if they, if they behave badly, or if they are disorganized or incompetent, Ooh. you know, these are not media outlets that I want to be associated with, you know? Because what, what, what do I get out of it? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, it's not, it's not clear um, what benefit. One of the things, one of the questions is, hey, well, you can promote your new projects. Well, I can't, because I can't talk about them. Right, that's like the, the most common question of the last 20 years I get is, so what are you working on now? And the answer is always, I cannot tell you mm -hmm. because we have signed non-disclosure agreements, we can't talk about it. Yeah. So, you know, it's different if someone is say, producing their own content, which some actors do. You know, some actors produce their own content and then they have an incentive to say, well, I can promote my content. You know, so if you want to interview a comic book creator, they're probably gonna be very eager yeah, yeah. because they're gonna need any outlet they can to help promote the comic book they're writing. But as voice actors, we are in this weird sort of position where we can't talk about what we're working on at the moment because we don't have control over the, over the property. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then what you have to appeal is, we do really good stuff, it would be really fun, or we're gonna let you talk about something you really care about, do you wanna come chat with us? Gotcha. Right? That would be probably the best way that I would know for me. So, yeah, like, well, you say like reputable sites, that's cool. Uh, so that's what kind of our site's working on is just building our reputation and yeah, it takes time. And you know, talking to a lot of people, networking, trying to be and putting out good content. Good content, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. putting out meaningful Correct. good content. Yeah, and 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 showing that you've got uh, a, a resume, uh, a track record mm -hmm. of putting out good of good content, and then that will attract more people, and that's called putting <laughs> in the work. Yeah, honest business. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You bet. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Um, I'm just curious about uh, what are some of your favorite like line flubs or like bloopers in the studio that you've ever done? Well, um, I do do my best. It, it depends. Like in anime, whenever I do like an outtake or I like try to do a funny line, it always has to match lip flap. Like that's part of the rule. Like if it's going to be a silly line, it's got to match lip flap. And um, Steve Bloom and I, uh, we don't do as much anime as we used to, but when we did, um, we would leave the dirtiest outtakes possible for each other um, to see if we'd get the other one to crack up while they were doing their part. Um, so there was, um, there's an anime called, uh, I think it's called Ghost Slayer's Ayashi, 
where Steve Bloom plays a rakish samurai, and I play this cross-dressing Shinto priest. And uh, so I'm looking very femme in this, in this show. And there's like a scene where we're talking to each other like in the rain, and you know, the rain's coming down, the, and we're talking to each other, and it just, it's ridiculously X-rated. And I, I hope the engineer like <laughs> saved the entire conversation. Because it wasn't just one line, it was like back and forth, and back and forth, and back, you know. Um, sometimes we'll get um, a, a, a meme going, like at one point when we were doing Fate Zero and I played Kira Kotamine, there was one point where my character was running away and he's got a bit of a mullet, you know? And, and so at one point he was running away and it was being really serious and dark and gritty and I said, I need a shave and a haircut, you know? And then shave and a haircut thing became like this running meme throughout the entire show. Like Matt Mercer picked it up and like he like shoots me in the head and goes, there's your haircut, you know? Like, I mean, like, <laughs> Like I mean, it was it was it was sort of fun, and like and then it went to like um, after Fate Zero, it went into like Fate Stay Night Unlimited Blade Works. Like we kept it going, like the, the, the shave and haircut crap. And I was like, now I want a mani pedi, you know? Like it was like it was very silly. Uh, but probably my favorite outtake that I ever did was on Dot Hack. So I played Lord Balmung of the Azure Sky, and at the end of the animated series, there was. Um, like this big party where all the different dot hack characters from different franchises came together. And Baumung is looking down at the party with a couple of other characters next to him. And the line that they gave me was, this party's really swinging. <laughs> and I looked at the line and I said, what is, what is this? What, why, you know? He said, well, we're trying to write a line where like Baumung's trying to be cool, but he's really dorky and he comes out with something stupid. And I was like, oh, oh, I got it, I got it. Roll it, roll it, roll it, right? And so, you know, we get the three beeps and come and go, beep, 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 this shindig is the bomb diggity. <laughs> and all the characters go, what? And Bob looks like, no, nothing, nothing, I said nothing. Um, so that's probably my favorite outtake that I made up. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> technology. Yes, technology. Hi. Hi. So after seeing you some years ago at Otakon for the first time, oh, I here. explored oh. some of your other anime projects other mm. than just Helsing and came across Scrapped Princess, mm -hmm. which I think is a very underappreciated anime. Why, thank you. Um, and my question is, uh, is there a project that you worked on that you feel is underappreciated and why? Yeah, I think one of the most underappreciated uh, projects I worked on uh, is a film called Night on the Galactic Railroad. Um, so I worked on this, oh, I think I worked on that show back in 2000. Um, and uh, so what it is, it's a film, um, it's an adaptation of a book called a Night on the Galactic Railroad or Night on the Milky Way Railroad, uh, Ginga Tetsudo no Yoru is the original Japanese title. And it was written by Kenji Miyazawa, who is one of the most famous poets in Japan. Um, and it's this um, sort of novella, I'm not even sure it's full no novel length, about um, a young boy who's sort of ostracized by his fellow classmates. And he goes up on a hillside and has a sort of vision, a dream of a train coming out of the galaxy down, picking him up, and then he goes on this galactic train through the sky. Captain Harlock, anyone? Um, so Galaxy Express 999 was influenced by Kenji Miyazawa's work. And, um, but this is a direct adaptation of his work. And um, all the characters are anthropomorphized cats, which is really sort of adorable. And um, it, was, it was very near and dear to me and to my wife. And um, it happened to, Central Park Media happened to have the license back in the late 90s. And they were gonna release, it. they had released it subtitled, but they never released it dubbed. And so I got hired to do the script and I really, uh, went after it whole hog because his writing is so sophisticated. He's trying to synchronize Christianity, Buddhism, quantum physics. I mean, like he's doing some crazy stuff. And so I'm doing like comparative mythology and studying Werner Heisenberg and the Uncertainty Principle and Niels Bohr and Copenhagen and all those quantum physicists and whatnot um, to try to, to make sure that the script is working well. Um, and I think it came out absolutely beautifully. Um, uh, Veronica Taylor plays the main character, Giovanni. I play the best friend, Campanella. Um, and there's some, Lisa Ortiz is in it um, as well. And um, I thought it came out really well and then it went completely out of print for a long time. And now it's back, at least it was, because Discotech got it and released it on Blu-ray. And what's even better is that when they released it on DVD, they missed a line. 
So for the better part of 20 years, I had been agonizing because that line was missing from the dub. And when I found out the discotheque was going to release it on Blu-ray, I like called up the, the I, um, my friend Michael Sinner Nicholas was working on it, on the production of it, and another guy that I knew. And I called them up and I basically said, we have to get that line in. And so we chased down the original voice actress who happened to still be in New York and had her do the pickup line and we put it in the Blu-ray. So we finally, after you know, 15, 16 years, we fixed the dub on, that, on the Blu-ray so it actually doesn't have the missing line anymore. So yes, Night on the Galactic Railroad. Awesome. Get it on Blu-ray. That works. Cool. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Rosa. Um, I have more of a request than a question because I asked you my question back in 06. Okay. <laughs> it's a very good year. Very good year. Very good year. Um, anyways, I've been a big Helsing fan for over 15 years now. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, uh, tomorrow's my 29th birthday, and I was wondering if I could record you, or excuse me, record Alucard telling me happy birthday, please. Uh, sure. All right, hold you ready? On. Sorry, I'm shaking. That's all right. We're rolling? Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday, you undead maggot! <laughs> Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. You totally made my year. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. She'll be back next year for her 30th birthday, and then 31st, and 32nd. Okay. Uh, hi, Chris. I mean this for life. Okay, yeah. Hi, Russman. Um, First met you and uh, I first saw you at my first con I ever went to, which was Oticon 2011. Wow. And yeah, it's been a while. And unfortunately, I didn't get to meet you that weekend. Uh, I don't remember what happened, but I, I mean, I'm very glad to see you again. I probably um, disappeared to pump a smoke or something. Uh, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, I always ask this every voice actor I run into this question. Um, so my favorite role of yours is actually playing you playing on. Um, Itachi Uchiha in Naruto. Mm -hmm. So, of all the projects you've done, in, you know, video games, anime, yada yada yada, what is your favorite role and why? Mm. So, I'm a little, a little different, probably, from most voice actors in that I have a hard time separating the character from the story. So, I got into acting not because I'm obsessed with character, but because I'm obsessed with story. So, I would much rather play a smaller character in a really good story than the lead in a story that's sort of mediocre, you know? So um, the, two, the two projects that I'm probably most proud of working on are um, Overwatch right now. Overwatch is, I find, incredibly inspirational, and I'm, I'm very honored to be able to play Winston in Overwatch. But as far as anime is concerned, it would be Wolf's Reign. So Wolf's Reign, uh, I played Sume in Wolf's Reign, and that was sort of a dream project come true. Um, and I, I don't really think I've worked on an anime that has touched me the same way. Um, so, would you like to share with the group? <laughs> Those would be Shots. my handlers Shots. at my panel, <laughs> disrupting the event to talk about another voice actor. <laughs> I know where you sleep. <laughs> All right. But, uh, oh, uh, well, okay, I guess I'll ask. Um, this might be a bit of a stupid question, but um, would you say there's a way for anybody to, like, say, gauge their interest in the entertainment industry? Like, say, if, you know, to discover if they wanted to, like, say, work in it? Do you uh, want to? Uh, I mean, well, I had a. Do you like ice cream? I do like ice cream. How, how does one test how much one likes ice cream? They just, they just do it. I, I don't know. Or they just That's eat it. That's tough. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking for someone else to give you external approval to say, yes, you should do this thing, then they're telling you to do it, not you. I mean, no one, no one, I mean, someone convincing you to do something is you working under the influence. And when you do that driving, you get arrested, get a ticket. <laughs> Fairly good point. Right? Like, I mean, I mean, you have to decide what you care about. And, and, and frankly, I think that is possibly the only thing that is essentially you. A lot of people want to talk about their own identity, like, this is just the way I am. It's like, no, you could be different, right? If you've been raised in a different part of the country or in a different country altogether, you might speak differently, you might behave differently, you might have different interests, you know? Like, we're pretty, we're pretty malleable creatures as humans. 
you know, and we change depending on where we, the influences we have growing up. But one thing I don't think that really changes very much is what we like. You either like chocolate ice cream, or you like vanilla, or you don't like either, or you like both. Like, you know, you just like what you like. And so your desires sort of define really who you are. And it's really hard to convince somebody, yeah, you really like sushi. I'm like, no, I don't. You know, like, like there's no, there, there's sort of no way around that. There's, there's, you know, you either, you like it or you don't, you know? Um, I mean, I guess some things can be acquired tastes, but for the most part, you know, you like a story or you don't. You like an activity or you don't. Um, and so I, you would have to decide whether you like the entertainment industry. Um, and this is the case in following anything, right? Is that, that you say, huh, I like this thing, and you start pursuing it. And as you pursue it, it's like going up a mountain. You know, as you get more and closer to being more professional at it, things get tougher. Competition gets fiercer. This is the test, right? This is a test to find out, do you care enough, right? Uh, do you, are you, a, and when it comes to like the entertainment industry, you sort of have to be obsessed, right? right? You could be sort of a, a laid back accountant, but you sort of have to be obsessed to be in the entertainment industry. And so you, you reach a, a difficulty curve. And at some point, you have to make a decision. Is this too much? Or am I into this, you know? And if somebody says, you know what, I don't like this, I'm out. There's nothing wrong with that. Because that just means you're climbing the wrong mountain. Go find the right one. You know, I mean, I started as a theater person, and I was way into theater when I was young, and I wanted to be a singer, actor, dancer, Gene Kelly, you know, triple threat, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, there came a point where I had to make a decision. You know, the kind of theater that I wanted to do didn't get done in America very much. It got done in the UK all the time, and if I was British, I probably never would have left the theater. But as an American, I, I either had to, like, found my own theater company or pursue this animation thing that I liked. And I had to make a decision, and I was like, I'm leaving the theater, I'm going into voiceover, I'm gonna go into animation and, and video games and whatnot. And I had people are like, why are you leaving the theater? You're throwing it all away. And I'm like, damn straight, <laughs> I'm out. Like, this is not my thing anymore. I'm gonna take everything I learned and apply it to this new thing I'm, I'm working on. But just because I started up one path doesn't I mean I have to stay with it if it's, not, if it's not my jam anymore. So you gotta find your jam. Right. Makes perfect sense. Okay, good. All right. Thank you very much. You Again, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Or see you again. Okay. <laughs> I've been seen. Uh, hello, Kristen. Hi. Uh, just, this is more of a request. Uh, I'm gonna ask, but first a question, uh, if possible. Uh, have you ever seen Avengers Infinity War? I have. Uh, can you do, can you, can you do an eloquent voice of Thor's line saying, bring me Thanos? If possible, uh, if you want to. Sure. Bring me Thanos. Uh, thank you. For breakfast. <laughs> mm, tastes like eggplant. Okay, hi. hi. So, I'm really interested in translation work from mm. Japanese to English, and obviously two very different languages, and it's kind of hard to transmit that. Um, and so you've talked about lip flaps and stuff like that. How much does dialogue change in the studio, if at all, to match up with that, and but still maintain the same uh, kind of meaning? Mm, yeah, yeah. So the process that usually happens is that um, a Japanese, I assume you're talking about Japanese shows. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So if you've got a, a Japanese show, uh, what happens is, is that when the uh, licensor, whoever is trying to release the Japanese show in English, uh, will hire people to dub it into English. The first process is obviously just translating. So what they do is they hire someone who's an interpreter to translate the Japanese into English. Now that translation is usually pretty straightforward literal, like as, as sort of straightforward and simple as possible. Then what happens is that that literal translation is handed to a script adapter. That script adapter is someone who is adept, hopefully, at taking that script translating the cultural references, making sure that the language is speakable, because sometimes the translation works well written or read, but it's hard to say, right? The phonemes are awkward. Um, so they have to make it speakable. They have to translate it out of the passive voice, which Japanese tends to go into, and do it into more active voice, which sounds better in English. Have to make sure that all the characters are speaking with their same voices, right? So not all the characters are using the same way of speaking, because they're all different characters and then has to match the lip flap on the screen. Not easy. Most of the people who do that kind of ADR script adaptation work tend to be voice actors themselves because they know what they need 
in the booth to make things work. Um, not always the case. There's a there's a there's a handful of of script adapters who are not voice actors um, that are very good, uh, but but the majority I would say probably of script adapters tend to be voice actors. Um, so and then even then sometimes things get uh, uh, tweaks in the booth in the moment, but hopefully there's a, a minimum of that. Um, so that's sort of the process. So what what part of that process are you curious about? I was just curious about the translation process itself and how that you switch a Japanese text to an English text and make it still make sense. Obviously, you're not doing the translating. But right. Like... So, I, I mean, I can't tell you how to translate from Japanese to English because while I know a little bit of Japanese, I am no, by no means anywhere near fluent, so I can't do that. I'm not good enough to do that. So that's up to them. But as a performer, it's more important, because I'm not being hired to be the translator, it's more important for me to understand the Japanese cultural references. Because sometimes a straight Japanese translation will come across and they don't know what the hell is going on. For instance, I, uh, when I had first started working with my agent, um, there was a young agent at my agent's office who was a go-getter, and she was like, I know people at Pixar, I can get you into stuff. Now, what she meant was that she could get me like background roles at Pixar. Like, I wasn't gonna be able to play a lead at Pixar because I'm not a celebrity, I'm not an on-camera celebrity. But she, that's what she meant. But I one-upped her because I knew that Pixar was in charge of dubbing the Miyazaki films. And at the time, I knew that Howl's Moving Castle was in production. So I said, okay, can you get me on Howl's Moving Castle? And she's like, what's that, right? Because she didn't know. And I was like, just call Pixar. Ask, they'll know what I'm talking about, right? So sure enough, a couple months go by, and I get a call from her saying, well, I just talked to the guys at, at Disney, Pixar, um, and they're listening to your demo on your website. So good to have a website and a demo, right? They're listening to your demo on your website. Uh, can't promise anything, but we'll see what they say. Okay. Literally a couple hours later, okay, that was easy. You're going in tomorrow to record. You're either going to play a soldier or a prince. They're not sure which yet. <laughs> I was like, okay. So if you know How's Moving Castle, the soldier they wanted me to play is in the very beginning of the movie, there's those soldiers that grab Sophie and they're being all creepy. Well, they could find lots of creepy guys in L.A. to play that. Like, there's plenty of guys in L.A. that can play creepy. It's not a problem. The problem they had was the prince. Prince Turnip, Turnip Head, is a bishonen, he's a beautiful boy. And they don't know what to do with that. They don't understand that character. Not because they don't understand the Japanese language, because they don't understand Japanese culture. They don't understand that Japanese have a history of pretty boys. And so I waltzed in and they said, so we've got this prince, but he looks like a girl and we don't know. I was like, I got this, right? This is my archetype. These are the kind of characters I play in anime all the time. So they'd scheduled me for like an hour to do this dubbing. I got it done in 15 minutes. You know, like I was like, bang, bang, bang. Yeah, I got this. And they're like, what? And we spent the next 45 minutes talking about the culture of the story because they were very good writers, but they weren't familiar with the culture of Japan. And so there were certain things that were going completely over their head. You know, when most people watch Princess Mononoke, they think it's a very Japanese film. It's a very subversive film because the main character is not Japanese. Prince Ashitaka is in Mishi. He's it's based on the Ainu, who are Caucasian. That's why when you have the Council of Elders, they all have beards. So you have a Japanese film with a white guy as the hero. And the samurai are the bad guys. This is really subversive to the Japanese psyche. Like, and then you have Lady Iboshi, who's sort of this female subversive leader, and her name is literally Lady Manhat. <laughs> right? That's what Iboshi means. She's literally Lady Manhat. What? Right? So, like, there's so much. And, and Ashitaka doesn't even use a samurai sword. He doesn't use a katana. He uses this, like, weird wide sword. And he doesn't ride a horse. He rides that elk. I mean, everything about it is trying to tweak the Japanese culture. But if you're American, you're like, I don't know, it just looks Japanese. No, not to the Japanese, it doesn't. Like, it looks really sort of trippy. So that, having that kind of understanding can, can really help when you're adapting things. Okay. Thank you. That's you helpful to hear. No problem. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Good. Cool. Um, you mentioned that you were a um, uh, oh, mythology major. I'm no, just... not, not a mythology major. I, oh. I didn't actually major. Okay. Uh, in, in, in college, I majored in theater and minored in computer science. Uh -huh. um, I did take a religion class in college, but most of my mythological studies have been after school. Okay, it was afterwards. Okay. Yeah. I know, if anything else, some of this already has been sort of answered as far as like uh, more for the story than anything else for what motivates you into uh, your roles. 
I was just also wondering with with the, the mythology studies that you also done, did that also propel you into uh, doing some of the roles that you've done, like since you began, especially like say like with like the Slayers and especially Chronicles of Heroic Night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, so the, my mythology studies. Um, came out of the fact that I, when I was in uh, graduate acting school in New York, I went to Columbia for acting school, I had a sort of life crisis. Um, this can happen, especially in graduate school when you're not sleeping and you know, you're know you spending all day in the basement of a black box theater trying to figure out how to act. Um, and think nothing is going right. And, and that's sort of where I was. I, I had this sort of artistic and life crisis. Like nothing was working. My artistry sucked. My acting sucked. You know, I didn't, my relationship sucked. You know, like everything sucked. Um, and in the middle of all that, um, I had to try to figure out why I was trying to be an actor. What did I want to say? What did I care about? And I wasn't sure. And it was at that time that uh, two things came into my life. One, uh, I rediscovered anime, which I had enjoyed when I was uh, young, all through middle school and high school, mm -hmm. had lost contact with in college, because I went to college between 90 and 94. Okay. And so um, we didn't really have media. The internet existed, but the web did not. So yeah. it was like Usenet and Archie and Veronica. Um, I mean, the first browser was uh, Mozilla Netscape in yeah. 95, right? Um, and so um, uh, I had no access to anime until I got to New York and there was actually a store uh, down in the East Village that sold anime. It was called Anime Crash. They sold it on VHS tapes. And so then suddenly I could get my hands on anime again. So I, I got reintroduced to anime and I was introduced to Joseph Campbell's work on comparative mythology. Um, I was able to watch uh, the PBS documentary series The Power of Myth, which is now on Netflix, which is awesome. Um, six part documentary series, really great introduction to Joseph Campbell's scholarship. Um, and Campbell, became my Rosetta Stone. He allowed me to translate and unpack for my conscious mind why my subconscious was so attracted to Japanese animation. Because why would a nice white boy from the Midwest be interested in Japanese animation? They're like, shouldn't I be happy with Spider-Man and Superman? Like, what, what is this, you know? But I was obsessed with Japanese animation. Right. Um, and so that, that helped me realize that what I was fascinated by as an artist was mythological storytelling or an archetypal hero journeys. Like that, that sort of you know, epic myth, fa fairy tales, that was sort of where I was. I was not interested in Arthur Miller, death of a salesman realism, right? right? That did not thrill me at all. I was like Julie Taymor puppets and Lion King, and you know, like craziness, that's sort of, that's sort of what I was into. Yeah. So that absolutely influenced why I wanted to get into anime so much, um, because I literally was working on an Arthur Miller play on Broadway oh. when I booked my first big anime job, which was Zelgadis and the Slayers. Woo! And so, I was, and, and I was more excited about booking Zelgadis than I was about being on Broadway, oh, yeah. which was sort of indicative. I was like, well, I guess I need to change direction, right? Yes. Um, and so, because, um, Arthur Miller, especially in the, in the show we were doing, which was A View from the Bridge, it gestured at Greek tragedy, but it, it wouldn't go there. It wouldn't actually follow sort of Aristotle's rules of uh, pity and terror for creating a proper Greek tragedy. And so it felt unsatisfying. Whereas when I went to anime, there was mythology and hero journeys all up the wazoo, you yeah. know, over and over and over again. And so I was like, that's where I want to live. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it absolutely influenced why I chose the, um, the areas of entertainment that I wanted to work in. Um, and I think that's true of sci-fi and fantasy as, mm -hmm. as well. You know, they tend to go for more archetypal hero journeys, much more so than, um, I don't know, whatever, you know, No Country for Old Men, which is, you know, like this sort of gritty, realistic stuff, which, which I can admire from a distance. I can say, look, that's a really well-made movie. I just don't care about it. You know, like that just yeah. doesn't interest me. Yeah, no, if anything else, there's like, Plenty of stuff like that, similar to what you mentioned. It's like eh, it's okay, but I'm kind of. I mean, they, this they, should, meal, you know? they should be all flavors in the kitchen. I'm, I'm not saying anything well, shouldn't be made. I just yeah. don't want to eat it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're free to. Yeah, yeah, they're free to go ahead and make this all they want. It's like yeah, I, mean, that's I can't stand Tabasco, but by all means, put it on everything. Yeah. You know, <laughs> go for it. Yeah, and then um, well, you guys can eat that. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for answering my question. You bet. All right. 
I have a question, and then after I get my, hear the answer, I would like to say a line from one of your past works. I'm glad we have a plan. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, I've seen your, or technically have heard your work from, since I was 13, from the early 2000s, and when I looked up your filmography, there wasn't much. Was there an issue like you couldn't get to a bit, to a studio location, or there wasn't any an future anime that interested you? I'm confused. There wasn't much what? You, you looked up my filmography from 2000 and you couldn't find what? I couldn't find any recent anime projects you were on after 2011. After 2011? Fate Zero? Da -da -da -da. Um, the, uh, like currently? I know that there's well, one... Well, it's 2018, so yeah. it's 2011 is seven years ago. So you're, you're asking that there that I'm not in that many anime right now as of 2018? Yes. Ah, okay. Well, the reason for that is not much anime is being done union right now. Um, so a lot of anime has gone to Texas and is being done in Funimation. And uh, all that is being done non-union. And I'm a member of the Actors Union. And I can only work on union projects. So I have done uh, the anime film Flavors of Youth on Netflix, which is by the same uh, studio that did Your Name. Um, and I'm in that with uh, Rachel Evan Wood from Westworld and whatnot. Um, and so I did work on Flavors of Youth. There is another anime that I'm working on right now that I can't talk about, uh, but it will come, back, uh, come out at some point. Um, most recently, it's been a lot of the uh, fate Franchises, Fate Zero, Fate One, Fate Two, Fate Three, you know, all the different fates. Um, uh, and so, because I've been reprising uh, Kira Kotomine, uh, that's because Anaplex is one of the few animation studios that still do some of their projects union. Um, so we're doing that. And then every once in a while, they call me back to play Itachi in Naruto, and I'm like, aren't I dead? <laughs> um, so um, that's, that's that, and who, who knows, there may be, there may be uh, other stuff in the future on that, but that, that's part of why I'm not doing as much anime is because there's not as much union anime to be done. Okay, now this is one of my favorite lines because it always made me laugh when I first saw it in episode three. <clears throat> Hideki! 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 All right, there you go. All right, so you've worked on a lot of projects that have a lot of different, very interesting mythos. Mm -hmm. um, some of which are very interesting amalgamations. I'm looking at Durara. Ah. And I was wondering, out of all of the different ones, if you have a favorite, or if you have one that has like a favorite element, not necessarily the overarching mythos, but like I like this piece of the mythos that they created here. Mm. Yeah, as far as overarching, I'd go, probably go back to Wolf's Reign because I, I, I think it's so... You may be familiar with starting an anime and thinking, wow, this has got a really good premise. I can't wait to see where this goes. And by the end, it never ends, yeah. right? Like, it just sort of craps the bit. Um, and they don't wrap anything up. The wonderful thing about Wolf's Reign is that it ends. <laughs> you know, like, there is an ending. <laughs> and it is not messing around, right? So by the time you get to the Wolf's Reign, you're like, okay, guess there's not going to be a sequel. Because I don't know what you do after that, right? And that's very satisfying, because a story doesn't have meaning until it ends. You don't really know what a story means until you find out how it all ends up. So it, it, that's why I find a lack of ending very frustrating. Um, but in terms of individual elements, one of the things I like about Durarara and the notion of the Dullahan and, and, the, and the sort of um, Irish spirit without a head riding around on her motorcycle is that in many other types of storytelling, especially if an American were doing it, they'd always keep her hidden. Right? The whole idea is that Buffy can't really say she's the vampire slayer. Right? If she tells the cops that she's the vampire slayer, it all falls apart. And there's actually a rule about this in American screenwriting. It's, in a, it's a book called Save the Cat. And in, if you read the Save the Cat, which has some really good uh, insights on, on screenwriting, one of them says, and this is a rule that, that they picked up from Spielberg, never invite the press. Like the moment you bring in the media, your movie is in trouble because now it has to stand up to interrogation, right? And so one of the things when Spielberg was, was making E.T., you'll notice the news cameras never show up. 
scientists show up, creepy people show up, the FBI or the CIA or the who, who's he, what's it, the X-Files people show up. But the news reporters don't show up because when the news reporters show up, it, it, can, it can really screw with the world you're trying to build. Do ra ra ra, Selty reveals herself on everybody's camera phone. Like, she basically posts herself on the internet, Instagram style. Oh my God, right? So like they break that huge rule and then they deal with the consequences, which is once Selty is no longer an urban legend, a la Buffy or anything else, but she is now the primetime news story, the cops show up and that creepy cop on the motorcycle starts chasing her and Selty freaks out. She has like panic attacks about this cop hunting her down, right? Oh, that's so satisfying, right? Like if we're, you, you, you take this idea, you actually make it public and then deal with the ramifications of that. You don't just skate over it. Like for instance, when um, Civil War, Captain America Civil War came out, I was aware of the whole Civil War storyline in the comic books, but I hadn't read it. Well, I had Marvel Unlimited, the app on my iPad, and it allows you to go and read all the back issues. And what they do is they set up playlists of like different events in the Marvel Universe, and one was Civil War. So what they did is they basically lined up all the comic books for Civil War of all the different like, you know, uh, branches, you know, so you don't have to buy 10 different different series. Like they got them all lined up on the app, and I just read them one after the other so I could learn everything about Civil War. And you know what? I still don't understand Civil War. Because they did end it. The whole notion that of, of do we register superheroes or do we not is completely sidelined because the scrolls show up. There's a scroll invasion and the whole notion of that philosophical problem, that conundrum, just gets left burning in the back kitchen and nobody is dealing with it anymore. And I'm like, that is so unsatisfying. Right? Like you open this really interesting philosophical conundrum and then just swept it under the rug. Screw you! Like, that's not, right? And so that's what I love about that, that thing in Durarara, which is we're going to open up this can of worms, and then we're going to deal with how do you deal with worms that are infested everywhere. Oh my god! How great is that? So that's, those are the most satisfying things for me. Thank you. You bet. Hi, I have an industry question. I'm, uh, I'm a recording engineer, mm. and I work... I'm doing my internship in advertisement, mm. but I want to get into anime and video games, like right. that spectrum. I just, being from Maryland, which isn't a very like anime, <laughs> doesn't have that. Like my family is always like, well, how are you gonna get into it? Like, I'm curious as to what you've seen with like how quickly and like they bring in new people, like how often like they get audio engineers and how many job openings there are. You know, it's funny. I've been getting this question more and more recently. Um, and so I've been trying to think about it because you have to understand that I am one of the rare voice actors that actually is really into audio tech because I was a sound designer in the theater. So like I was just at uh, Bangsome Studios and they have a new mix room and the guy who's like the recording engineer head of Bangsome Studios is like, Crispin, do you want to come see my toys? And I was like, yeah, I want to see your toys. He's like, we've got this 7.1 mix room with a bang, you know, and like, I'm like, oh my God, and you bounce, and I'm, I'm one of these voice actors that actually geeks out about the tech. But even with all of my geeking out about the tech, how engineers get hired and how they move from studio to studio is really a mystery to me. Like, I'll, I'll just show up at a studio and, oh, it's so-and-so is there. And I'm like, how did you, weren't you over there before, you know? But what I, what I have noticed is, first of all, you do sort of have to be in the room, right? I mean, you know, people ask me, can I voice act from anywhere? And I'm like, there's certain voiceover you can do from home, right? You can do audiobooks, you can do industrial narration, you can do phone trees. But if you're gonna work on animation and video games, you have to be where it's done because they want everybody in the same studio on the same equipment, you know? And the same is for engineers. You've gotta be where it's done because they need your hands on the, f on the faders to record everybody. I will say, there is not the greatest turnover. I have watched engineers work at the same studio for more than a decade, right? But I've also watched young'uns come up and intern at different studios and then show up. Like this one anime I'm working on now, there, w there was an engineer I'd never worked with before, and I was like, oh, so how long have you been engineering? And he was like, well, I started interning here about six years ago. And I was like, oh, really? You know, like, and then eventually he sort of worked his way up and now he's the ADR engineer in the show we're doing. 
So that's, that's how I watch a lot of people do it. There's a lot, I think it, it has to do with making personal connections because they don't tend to hold auditions. Yeah. As an actor, they send out auditions because they want the absolute best for whatever character they're going for. When it comes to engineers, they don't do that. And so it's all about, hey, do you know somebody? You know, and so the disadvantage of, of moving is moving. Um, and especially if you're going to LA, it's expensive to live in LA, right? And so it's hard to go to a place if you don't have a financial cushion underneath you or some sort of prospects. The advantage is there's a lot of stuff getting done in LA. And there's a lot of people who are scrambling for sound people because they forget. Like that, that's, they're all stressed about the camera and they forget about the sound. So even doing location sound, mm -hmm. right? And building up, you know, people doing student films going, oh crap, who's gonna hold the boom? I am, you know? And being able to do that is a way to get in. So there's, there's more inroads when there's just people making stuff 24 seven in LA. You know, it's, just, it's like an anthill of stuff. So basically you show up and make it known to as many people as possible. Like it's, it's a lot like theater. Sound. Theater is made by people who are in the room. So you gotta be in the room, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you've gotta be available, you've gotta be there, and people have gotta know you. And it's not something you can plan ahead of time. It's not like, well, I'm gonna interview for this job, and by the time I get to LA, I'm gonna work in this law office. I'm gonna, and it's, it doesn't work like that. Because it's about personal relationships, about people trusting you, and about, hey, can you do this thing? And you step up and do, yes, not only can it, but I can rock it. Right, and make everybody feel relaxed because they can trust you. Because there's there's so many moving parts anytime anyone's making anything in LA, whether it's a movie or an animated show or a video game, there's so many moving parts. No one person can keep track of it all. So what they wanna be able to say is, hey, you, can, can, can you record this and make it work? And you wanna be able to say, yes I can and you will like it. Great, then I don't have to think about that and I can, I can focus on something else, you know? So that's, that's what you gotta do. And, and, and because there are so many people starting in LA, it is possible for you to get in. And because they're so clueless about sound, oh my God, they're so clueless about sound, right? If you, if you are competent in any way, they, you will blow them away, right? If you can come in and do good work and, and save their butts. Um, I literally did this on, um, my, my brother was filming a short film and he asked me to do some location sound on it, and I did. But they did one day without me and they recorded in the bathroom, and they were recording, it was, they just started recording digitally to like P2 cards on a Panasonic camera or something, and there was some, there was some timing problem. The clock in, in the camera was off, and so they were getting digital clicks, little, little timing clicks. You know what I'm talking, right? They hadn't slaved it properly. And so um, they came to me, and they were also recorded it too low. Like it was very low signal, and so they came to me saying, can you fix it? And I was like, yeah, let me see what I can do. I had Isotopes RX, which you may be familiar with, um, this fantastic forensic plugin. And so I, I normalized the file to raise the noise floor. I cleaned up the noise floor with a broadband noise reduction. And then I went through and I declicked it all to make it all clean and I handed it back to them. And they said, what plugin do you, did you use? What you gave us sounds better than anything else in the film. We have to do it to the whole film now. <laughs> That's when you get the job, right? Okay. Yep. It's, I'm always like trying to figure out how to like network with audio engineers because like I know myself and the people I've met like there's a reason they're in the room and in the chair and not behind the microphone. Because they're not social. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're like you gotta network and I'm like how do how do I network it's with myself tough. because I like so so just kind of contain people. Here's a tip. There's a difference between networking and marketing. Too often people confuse those. Networking is just being friends with somebody. That's it. Period. Just be friends. Find common interests. Enjoy spending time together. That is all networking should ever be. You should never be trying to promote yourself while you're being friends with someone. It's icky, right? Marketing is promoting yourself. You only market to people that it makes sense to market to who need your work but you network with people who you want to build relationships with. And often, the better you are at just being friends with people, then the more comfortable they are, then the opportunities when they say, hey, you, you do sound stuff, right? Do you think you could do this? That'll come up. Rather than saying, hey, it's really nice to meet you. Just so you know, I'm really good at Pro Tools, and, I'm doing the, and, I, and my light showed up, wow. <laughs> um, so all you gotta do really 
is make friends. That's it. When I, when I was thinking about moving to LA, I had no connections. But my wife, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, had friends, and they were big Gargoyles fans for the Disney series. And they were putting together a Gargoyles convention in LA. Uh, and so they said, hey, Crispin, you're a voice actor. Do you want to come check out the Gargoyles convention? Um, and I was like, sure, I'd love to come. So I came to the Gargoyles convention, and I met some people. I met Taliesin Jaffe, the voice director on Helsing. And I met Jonathan Klein, producer at New Generation Pictures. And I met Greg Weissman, who produced Gargoyles. And we just became friends. And the other thing is, I had a laptop. I had a G3 Mac laptop that I was running Pro Tools free on. And I realized that it was actually functional enough to do video, that I could actually do an ADR session off this G3 laptop. I, I'd never seen anyone else do it, but I figured it out, right? And so I literally set up a voice acting workshop at, at the event and had people get up and try their hand at dubbing to picture at the event. This impressed Greg Weissman, who then came to me later and said, hey, I'm working on this animated series for Disney. It's based on the Atlantis movie. It's called Team Atlantis. I'd love to have you on it if you're around. Did I tell him I'm really good at voice acting? Did I give him my, him, my demo? No. I just was friends with him, and I showed up, and I kicked ass. That's, that's how it works. So you've got to find the way that engineers socialize, which is tough, right? That's your challenge. But if you can crack that code, you're in. Right? Because then if they know that they can trust you and they can be friends with you, then it's just a matter of time. Thank you. That you was bet. really helpful, actually. Good. Yeah. Five minutes. five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Five. That networking tip is going to be very useful to me very soon. Thank you. Good. But why I got into line, I am a major fan of Tokusa from Ghost in the Shell. Oh, cool. Not, not in a fanboy kind of sense or anything, but. I don't know if I should have a role model at my age, but he's it. Oh, good. I mean, you gonna get, get the mullet too? No. No. Uh, no. Well, past ah, that right. Point. Okay. But I mean, you know, his courage, and he throws himself in there, even though he can be shot, and everybody else that he's working with cannot right. be shot. <laughs> but what I find interesting is that that kind of character is usually the young hero. In the opera sense, he's usually the ingenue. And I find it very interesting that for his part, they got the guy that played Sume and Alucard, and they pitched the voice down and made him very serious, which is one of the reasons it works for me. Oh, and good. I wondered if you had any comments on that. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not using my Alucard Sume voice as Togusa. I right. mean, to Togusa is basically close to what I'm doing now. And so that's not what I do when I play Sume and Alucard. Um, but. Um, the thing that they wanted to know most, because I had played so many big Chew the Scenery characters, they wanted to know that I could sound like a cop, that I could sound every day. And the one that was really, the one, and th actually this got posted on somebody's website, like a review website saying, here, this is how you dub things. It was Togusa in the Interceptor episode where he's doing the whole Blade Runner thing. Mm -hmm. Enlarge 34 to 36. Stop, wait, rotate. Enlarge 42 to 23. What's that? Right, and it's just this very casual, as opposed to enlarge 43 to 22, <laughs> you know, which is like totally overacted. Um, and, and so that was, the, that was the challenge with Togusa, is to make him as, as sort of casual cop as possible. Um, and, and sort of that's what we were going for, because I've got to be the everyman, because the rest of section nine are all superheroes, right? So I've got to be the everyman with a revolver. And something to file into your memory banks, I uh, did a uh, kind of a storyline review for a panel I did about two years ago. Followed everything down, basically connection, connection. In every single version of Ghost in the Shell, Togus is the one who comes up with the first clue. Without his input, the rest of the storyline wouldn't happen. Oh, interesting. There you go. Good to know. All right, should we do one more, and then we might have to wrap up, because it is three. So. Hello. Hello. So this is more for curiosity's sake uh, involving the industry. Okay. I was actually wondering what a typical schedule and workload for a voice actor would be. And also, since you mentioned that you're in a union, does that differ from anyone that's not in a union? I've had family members that are also in entertainment, mostly musicians, where they've had some really hectic schedules versus me as a computer programmer where I work typical nine to five. So I was just wondering what the typical schedule is and what the workload would be. I wish there was a typical schedule, or maybe I don't. Actually, I like the flexibility of it. Um, uh, there isn't. I mean, there, there are weeks where I might be booked every day, 
Um, and then there were weeks where I might only have two gigs that week. Um, and when I don't have as many gigs, I'm working on other things. Um, so it's, it's really variable. And, and I think that applies whether you're union or non-union. It's just that the entertainment industry has sort of bust and boom cycles. You know, there's times when things get really busy and times when things get dead. Between Thanksgiving and New Year's, nothing in LA gets done. Right, like everybody just checks out and goes on vacation, you know? Uh, August also tends to be a sort of slow month for things. But man, a couple months before E3, dear Lord, stuff is getting done, you know? Um, so it, it, it's really variable. I mean, ideally most voice actors are hoping that usually, uh, at least with a union, uh, and non-union follows this as well, most voiceover sessions don't go more than four hours. So usually people are hoping to book a 10 to one and a two to six as many days as they can. Okay. You know, that's, that's what they're aiming for. Whether you can accomplish that or not is the challenge, right? Uh, but then again, you may have a commercial gig that only runs like an hour, but pays really well. So it, it, totally, it totally depends. Everybody's got uh, different schedules and they may do uh, other things as well. And just because you do voiceover doesn't mean you also don't do on camera. You know, so maybe you're off on a shoot somewhere doing something else. I'm weird in that I only do voiceover. I don't really pursue an on camera career, okay. um, but other actors do. Oh, thank you. You bet. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. All right, thanks so much. Uh, I know uh, there's more. I'm doing another panel. Well, I'm, I think we're doing at 5. I'm doing some autographs now in the foyer. And then at 5 o'clock, we're doing an intro to voice acting with a bunch of the other voice actors as well. So thank you so much for coming, and I hope you have a lovely con. Thank you. Thanks.